Um, like, well, the simple reason is just in the linear region, uh, the formula that we have doesn't have even a lambda. So today we are going to uh, talk about uh, dynamic behavior of MOS transistor and analyze propagation delay. Uh, before we do that, we will first introduce MOS capacitances and then we'll review the resistive uh, switch transistor model and uh, then we'll do uh, some delay analysis. Okay, couple announcements. Uh, make sure you check home page periodically for announcements. It's updated uh, frequently. We try to keep track of all the important announcements and updates on the, on the front page. Uh, to remind you, homework uh, 2 is due today. Uh, 240 Cori is the drop-off uh, box there. And uh, we'll post homework 3 later today. Um, a word uh, from enrollments office. I went to the scheduling office last week and I did try to uh, enroll everybody from the waiting list in the class, but they didn't let me do that. Uh, uh, campus has very strict rules uh, about enrollment policies and uh, the absolute uh, limit uh, for this room is 72 people. We had originally 60 uh, people uh, in uh, plan for, for this class. We already increased enrollments to 72 and they didn't let me do anything uh, beyond that. But um, for those of you who are still on the waiting list, I think uh, you have still a fairly good chance to get in because in, uh, before the class started, we had 160 people interested in the class. And then in the second week, uh, it got down to about 100. Uh, the waiting list was 30 people in the first week of classes. Today, it's 17. And out of those 17, I think it's only about uh, 10 or 12 uh, who did show up in the first week and uh, signed up for the class. I made sure that uh, those cases are uh, on top of priority list. So when someone drops, uh, they will get replaced. Uh, they will take their spots. Um, so from the uh, experience from previous semesters, uh, uh, the waiting list normally clears out in the first couple of weeks. You just need to be patient. Uh, there is no guarantee, of course, but I think uh, there is a uh, fairly uh, good chance that uh, you will still be in the class. Okay. So I would just advise you hang in there for another week or two, and I think you will be accommodated. Okay, so today's lecture we will do MOS transistor characteristics for uh, transient analysis and understand important models. Uh, for uh, propagation delay analysis of uh, CMOS gates. Uh, this is a review from last time. Uh, so if you were sleeping during the last lecture or uh, were absent for some other reason, here's your chance to catch up. If I have to teach you MOS models in 30 seconds, this is the one slide I would show you. This is the most important slide you need to remember. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. So after lecture, you go print out this slide, make a pocket version, carry it around with yourself. Look at this slide very often. Uh, make sure you, you refresh and understand this slide. Discuss it with your colleagues. Show it to your friends and family. Make sure you understand this slide. It's the single most important slide you need to know about MOS models, OK? Uh, so what this graph tells us is uh, ID versus VDS characteristic of an MOS transistor. And uh, what's important to observe here is that we have several regions of operations that we care about. We have linear or triode operation regime, where your transistor can be simply modeled as a uh, resistor, and the resistance is constant. 
because the slope of this i versus v line is constant. Then you have this effect of velocity saturation, where your uh, carriers are velocity saturated and, and then the speed can no longer increase, so you have saturation of current. If you enter that regime, then you have a linear relationship in VGS. If you keep increasing VGS, uh, you have only linear increase in uh, current. Uh, and that, the boundary between linear and velocity saturation is defined by this line. VDS is equal to VDSAT. We said that's a simplified model. So when you have your homework, print out this slide, as I said, and then figure out what's your VDSAT. It's very easy to figure out the operation mode of your transistor. Uh, then for small values of uh, VGS, you have conventional quadratic model. You have quadratic relationship uh, and conventional uh, saturation um, uh, regime. And the boundary between linear and that uh, conventional saturation is VDS is equal to VGT. So now you remember uh, in homework you had a question uh, to estimate uh, some of model parameters. And then you were asked which parts of IV characteristics were most important uh, to be matched. Okay? And then you were told to ignore velocity saturation uh, and use the quadratic uh, model. Uh, to estimate the threshold voltage. So does this trigger some ideas? Which values would you pick for VGS? Would you go over here, or would you try to do it here? Yes. So you would, you would try to do it in saturation from conventional formulas. So besides providing a database and list of parameters in homework that you uh, have uh, at uh, your disposal, uh, you also need to think. Uh, and make sure that besides uh, having this graph in front of you, you exactly know where is this all coming from and what it means. Question? Yeah, for the homework, if you use different formulas, one was the unified model and the other one for the regular saturation equation, we get different answers for, like, they vary very much. I know which one you should choose. Uh, so the question is, if you use uh, different formulas, one is unified, another one is saturation region, you get different answers. The, the answer for, for that is, you need to make sure you understand the unified model. That's the next slide. It's the second most important thing you need to know. And that is, a uh, unified model actually is a superset of uh, three operation uh, modes, triode, uh, saturation region and velocity saturation. So it does include saturation. So you just need to make sure that you understand what's it about. And uh, homework suggested that you should uh, try to use the quadratic model, which is also part of unified model. Mo unified model reduces to quadratic model if you plug in V min is equal to uh, uh, VDS, uh, VG VGT rather. Uh, and uh, there you have then to choose the appropriate values for VGS to make sure that you, st that you are in saturation model because it doesn't make sense to fit uh, velocity saturation curves with the saturation model. Another question? Uh, even when we are in the conventional saturation regime, uh, if the VDS voltage is increased, uh, the f electric field in the channel is also increasing. So at that time, it's a velocity saturation doesn't play a role. Means will the device enter into velocity saturation? Uh, that is uh, still, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, so when you, uh, for, for small VGS, uh, then uh, the question is, does the device enter uh, velocity saturation because you have a strong uh, electric field? But then uh, uh, for in, in a simplifi simplified model that we use, you basically assume that uh, over there you, you don't have that high of a density of carriers that will uh, cause this scattering effect. And then you assume to a first order that velocity saturation does not uh, happen. But this is actually, it, it's a mix of a lot of effects. And I'll, I'll uh, talk later in the class uh, how these effects are or, uh, modeled. You have basically a bunch of secondary order effects, and we are just trying to make a reasonable as assumptions and approximations here that uh, will give you formulas for the design perspective such that you can make a, a good uh, approximation. That was a good question, though. If you want to know more about that, uh, then you uh, should uh, probably go to E130. They, they talk about that in great detail. Okay, so this is the most second important, uh, second most important uh, uh, slide, and uh, besides uh, knowing these curves, you need need to know the model uh, for for your uh, transistor. So, and this is a unified model. This is one formula that you need to remember uh, to 
uh, basically be able to model uh, operation of your transistor in any uh, regime that's shown on the previous slide. What's uh, interesting about this model, uh, it provides a reasonably good approximation in regions of operation that we really care for as a designers. So if you look back at the slide, uh, then you see that uh, in this transition region, uh, the discrepancy is quite high between a uh, spice simulated result and uh, your model. And, but the model holds pretty well in the saturation region as well as the linear region. So you need to make sure that you understand that limitations of, of the model. And as we saw in the previous class, uh, this model was very useful uh, to, for analysis of uh, large signal DC type of behavior of a transistor. And this is the model of a transistor current source model that we used uh, to derive uh, DC behavior and voltage transfer characteristic. Later today, we will use different model, and we'll talk about that in more detail for uh, performance analysis. This model for, as a current source will turn out to be too complicated, so we'll simplify and use the switch model with equivalent resistances and capacitances. Okay? So, um, we talked last time also about uh, voltage transfer characteristic, and I think in the next homework we'll give you another problem on um, VTC, just to make sure you get the methodology right. And uh, in order to uh, derive the VTC of an inverter, you had to uh, superimpose uh, PMOS load lines on top of NMOS family of curves, ID versus VDS for different VGS values. And uh, to translate PMOS characteristics, because all the values for PMOS were negative and the values for the NMOS were positive, uh, then you have to do some coordinate transformations and uh, do in three steps, basically. Uh, so shown here is uh, the first two steps. You have to uh, flip a sign of uh, the current. Then you have to reverse order labeling of uh, your VGS curves, because you have that your uh, uh, V in is equal to now VDD minus VGS and plus VGS in, in this case rather, and uh, then you have to shift for the VDS, and that's how you get these load lines. Uh, then from there, you basically uh, pick uh, points uh, that correspond to the same V in and the same V out, and you equate the currents, because that's another condition that has to hold. And then picking these different points, we went through um, this family of curves uh, to obtain voltage transfer characteristic. And what, what was notable here that this transition for a very small increment of uh, input voltage was fairly sharp here. That defined the transition region where to, uh, your uh, inverter had fairly high gain. And you were able to obtain nice and smooth uh, CMOS inverter uh, transfer characteristic. And this shows uh, trajectory of this uh, point as you increase uh, your uh, input voltage, and what's notable here is that the operation regime uh, for these different transistor changes as you traverse this path from V in uh, equal to zero over to V in is equal to VDD. So now, in your homework, uh, you were required to compute some of these parameters, and then you had to um, calculate parameters such as VM and so on. And then in a bunch of uh, circuit configurations in your homework, you had uh, to make decisions because uh, you um, basically compute VOL when your v VIH is at the input, uh, VOH is at the input, and you compute VOH when your VOL uh, is uh, at the input. But you know neither VOH nor VOL. So what you need to do there is basically, there is no basically standard recipe, but uh, if, if what, what you need to do is basically uh, first analyze and uh, understand clearly what you need to deliver. What what do you need to calculate? Then analyze the information that you are given. And then uh, drop down your pencil, wait, think for a couple of minutes, analyze the circuit. Make sure you understand uh, what your, what's your enemy. Uh, understand your enemy and then figure out the strategy uh, how, uh, how you can uh, solve the problem. And in order to do that, uh, you basically have uh, to make some assumptions about VIH or VOL. And those assumptions are based on that additional information uh, of uh, circuit operation. So what you need to do is you have basically a couple of ways to start. You can start either assuming some, VO, uh, some uh, high voltage at the input or some low voltage at the input. But um, you have to really sort your information uh, using um, 
sort of uh, in decreasing uh, believability. So you first start with the assumption that has the highest believability index because start with the assumptions that you're most confident in and say, okay, if I have, for example, a CMOS gate, I'm pretty sure that maybe my VOH is equal to VDD. And if I'm, my VOH is equal to VDD, that means there is no really no current because my VDS is really equal to zero. And then I'm going to plug back in uh, VOH is equal to VDD at the input. I will compute my VOL and see if for that given VOL, my uh, transistors are still turned off. That's verifying uh, your initial assumption. If that doesn't work out, you have to iterate several times. But you just need to make sure uh, what you're doing. Question. Um, I assume when you want to find V, uh, V N D, you, you always usually assume. Oh, you usually assume that the N MOS and P MOS are in saturation mode. Correct. And then, uh, do you always have to check to make sure that your assumption is correct Absolutely. or not? Absolutely. Then, if your assumption is not correct. Uh, what, what do you do next? I mean, you just use a different formula. You're just is is it a try and error kind of? Uh, for for the assumption, if or? you turn out that uh, you're, for example, assume that your both your transistors are, for example, in uh, velocity saturation, and you turn out that, for example, your N MOS is uh, velocity saturated, but your P MOS is saturated, then you just need to fix uh, your assumption and say, okay, let me now try because I have the contradiction. Let me try to work with saturation equations for the P MOS and uh, work out through uh, the calculations and then see if that still holds. So you, you, you have to be consistent. Your assumptions have to match your results. OK. OK, then we analyzed uh, this inverter gain. Uh, we said that it's very good uh, for a CMOS gate to have this sharp transition region uh, defined with very large gain such that you have clearly separated uh, lo logic levels and that you have very high noise margin, noise margins. And we provided a simplistic uh, uh, li piecewise linear model in which we uh, concluded that uh, gain is a very important factor. And you can derive uh, this gain over here, although it's not critically important to uh, remember these equations. So it's basically just in this region, you uh, spend only some period of time. It's desirable that you have your uh, gate with a very high gain, although you're not really designing this region. That's what we um, discussed last time. This is E140, E141 is away from there. And then uh, we also. Sh uh, concluded with this plot, as you keep uh, decreasing your supply voltage, what will happen? And uh, we observed several effects. So we first observed that uh, for initially, when you keep decreasing your supply voltage, then it seems that you have a nicer characteristic and you have a higher gain. And that's exactly because uh, your VGS uh, is now uh, low enough such that you no longer have velocity saturation, but you rather have saturation in which you have stronger transistors, more current, more gain. But uh, this all sound, uh, seemed very good, and, uh, but there were a couple of reasons why you don't really want to do that uh, at all times, because primary reason was uh, performance. And that's what, what we are going to learn and understand today in greater detail. Uh, second reason is that you have uh, reduced noise margins, uh, and in particular, you have uh, pronounced effect of the fixed external voltage sources that are uh, noise sources that are not proportional to uh, your signal levels. So you can't do anything about those. Your circuit is getting uh, in a to work in really noisy environment. And then if you keep decreasing uh, your VDD, you will eventually enter sub-threshold regime. Your transistor will still exhibit a uh, voltage transfer characteristic, although your uh, VGS is un uh, less than VT. And uh, then you will hit some a limit where your thermal noise becomes to matter. And that's about 2 to 4 uh, VT, KT on Q, thermal voltages. And that's where you really have, the, where you really kill your uh, device, but uh, this technique is actually uh, does have some applications. For example, in watches, th that you have basically a battery that runs uh, pretty for for a long period of time, so you have to minimize power consumption. Performance is certainly not uh, an issue there, so you have this kind of um, strategy to reduce the supply voltage and really run ultra low ultra low power. Uh, so. What we talked about uh, so far was uh, assuming that your NMOS and PMOS are clearly defined, that you have uh, nicely defined parameters, W and L, threshold, and so on.
but in reality you really have uncertainty in these parameters and you you may have either uh, wafer to wafer variations in these parameters or even on the same wafer you have to die to die uh, variations or even within the die you have variations across uh, the area of your chip where you have different uh, channel lengths, you have different thresholds because your doping concentration may change, uh, your um, oxide thickness may change, so you have really variation of, uh, of, you have a range of these values. And that is what's modeled in uh, SPICE uh, through process corners. So you have basically a fast process corner where your transistor is good, it delivers a lot of current, and then you have a worst case another extreme case where your transistor is really slow when all these factors work against you and then you have your slow corner which is indicated here so now uh, looking at this graph if we assume that the nominal voltage transfer characteristic was this uh, black line and um, so then we have a shift uh, to the right side if we have good PMOS and bad NMOS so now uh, based on what we uh, discussed so far uh, what does good means in terms of TOX would TOX increase or decrease to make transistor better from the performance, uh, from the current standpoint? Decrease, that's correct. Uh, how about L? Decrease, W, increase, and VTH constant, Y constant? Decrease, that's right. So on the, on, in the, on the other way you have, in the other direction you have uh, uh, bad transistor and uh, if you have a good PMOS, bad NMOS, your VTC curve shifts to the right. If you have good NMOS, bad PMOS, it shifts to the left. And uh, now the question is uh, when you're designing your circuits uh, then which model to use? Sometimes uh, you want to really be safe and say I'm going to over design my circuit, I want to design it for performance under the worst case corner using slow, slow uh, transistors slow PMOS, slow NMOS, but that is in most cases really overly uh, conservative uh, because it is very uh, unlikely that due to st statistical uh, distributions uh, that you will end up with all your devices in the really worst corner. So what uh, designers typically do is you design for uh, the nominal corner and then uh, that gives you pretty good um, uh, result uh, that after fabrication you you will probably have some averaging of of the effects uh, but uh, y there is no guarantee of course that you will have uh, your specs as you you intentional initially uh, intended for because uh, you may end up really in the worst case corner and then uh, your specs are uh, not uh, satisfied okay so much for uh, DC and large signal uh, analysis. Any questions? Okay, so now we are finally going to some interesting uh, topics and uh, analyze uh, speed and dynamic operation of MOS transistor. To do that, we have to first study MOS capacitances. So now when you look at the symbol of MOS transistor, basically it, it's a four terminal device and it has capacitances between each of each pair of terminals except uh, drain to source which is uh, basically uh, there is a conductive channel between the drain and source so there is no capacitance so now we need to understand where are all these capacitances coming from so we have a lot of uh, parasitic effects here what you don't want is actually these capacitances because they affect they hurt your delay they're just loading your uh, driving gate and uh, adversely affected affecting your performance. So now let's first understand where are these capacitances coming from, uh, then derive some uh, simple models for uh, hand analysis and then see how we handle uh, these in our design equations. So the most important capacitance that you need to understand is basically the gate capacitance. It's uh, distributed over uh, three uh, terminals. So you have uh, gate to source capacitance, you have gate to drain capacitance, and you have gate to body uh, terminal capacitance. What's very interesting here is that we will um, pay special attention to this gate to drain capacitance because it's a floating capacitor. 
It's basically between two nodes that are biased independently, gate and drain. All other capacitances are pretty much like gate uh, source and bulk terminals are typically at uh, a fixed voltage, which is either a ground for NMOS or VDD for PMOS. And then you have all capacitances between some voltage and ground terminal. But this is a special case here where you have the floating uh, capacitor here. And we will uh, do uh, uh, careful analysis of uh, that uh, capacitor there. So uh, let's first understand uh, the gate uh, capacitance. And uh, in order to do so, we will have to look at uh, the cross-sectional and top view of our MOS transistor. <laughs> so you have uh, diffusion regions for source and drain, and then you have oxide on top that defines, uh, and polysilicon de that defines your gate. So what we, you know from uh, device physics uh, is that uh, when, whenever you have a PN junction, that's basically a capacitance. You have uh, junction capacitance. And uh, we can uh, analyze this uh, gate over here as a capacitance, uh, because you have dielectric that is uh, T-ox tall, and it has some uh, area and uh, some uh, process-related uh, constant. So you have uh, your gate capacitance per unit area is simply equal this uh, unit area capacitance is equal to epsilon ox over T ox. And then to get the uh, value of the gate capacitance, you have to uh, multiply that by the area of the gate. And this is all nice and easy unless you start considering uh, real life second order effects that are complicating this picture uh, a little bit. So that's the principle. Uh, so what we have here is that in this model, we assume that uh, we have a perfectly aligned channel that you have, going to the overhead for a second, that you have your gate, and then you define your diffusion region that are right under the channel, that you have a perfectly aligned, self-aligned MOS. But in reality, you always have some diffusion region under the gate. And uh, you have some overlap of your gate with both your source and drain terminals. And this overlap depends on manufacturing process. And we label this overlap of gate and source drain regions with this parameter xd. So what you have is actually that your effective channel length is equal to your drawn channel. This is your LD minus two times xd. We assume that uh, this uh, under diffusion is uh, approximately equal for the gate and source, which is a valid assumption, because the way you fabricate your transistor, you first put a uh, gate on top, and then you deposit source and drain regions uh, with the same doping concentration. So they, they kind of diffuse under the gate in a uh, uniform way. So that's a good model. Uh, to have uh, in mind. And uh, this creates overlap, which uh, gives you another uh, parasitic capacitance here that you have between your drain and source regions with the gate. So you have C, let's label this drain. This is source. This is gain. So you have between gate and drain overlap capacitance. And that is proportional to some uh, unit capacitance, capacitance per unit area times uh, the area of this overlap. If you assume that your, your uh, transistor is W Y, then you have W times uh, this XD. So that's just one effect in the gate uh, capacitance. So you have these overlap regions. Uh, 
another component of the gate capacitance is this gate to channel capacitance and let's let's understand that going back to the slides uh, over here so you have a uh, gate to channel capacitance uh, divided between these other three terminals so you have to gate to channel capacitance uh, uh, be between uh, gate and body then you have gate and source and you have uh, gate and drain terminals and we analyze three different operation regimes as you will see later these capacitances are highly nonlinear but we will make some uh, simplistic assumptions here and make them linear for the purpose of uh, design equations and analysis so what's happening here in the cutoff region uh, you have basically a capacitor that is formed between your gate and your bulk uh, the thickness of that capacitor is T ox that's the oxide of the gate so you simply have that in the cutoff region this uh, gate to channel capacitance between gate and body is equal to capacitance uh, per unit area you have this uh, oxide capacitance it's epsilon ox over T ox times W times L effective so you have effective channel length times W that's your gate to channel uh, capacitance uh, in the cutoff region then uh, when you go uh, over uh, to saturation and resistive mode of operation what you have is basically you have this inversion layer under the gate which shields away uh, your bulk terminal from the gate terminal so you no longer have your uh, gate to bulk capacitance in triode and saturation mode so as soon as your transistor is turned on you have inversion layer under the gate body is shielded and uh, gate to bulk capacitance disappears okay then you have another two components then you have uh, capacitance to source and drain in the resistive mode uh, you have your total gate to channel capacitance equally distributed between uh, gate to source and gate to drain because you have a uniform uh, charge across the channel to a first approximation so you have equally distributed uh, capacitance uh, to gate to source and gate to drain so these are both equal C ox W L effective divided by 2 and finally in the saturation region you have a pinch off at the drain side which basically makes this uh, channel to drain capacitance uh, gate to drain capacitance uh, equal to 0 and all your capacitance is now basically between gate and source and due to widening of depletion regions uh, you will have a slightly reduced capacitance so in this case you have no longer C ox W L but you have two-thirds C ox W L and the most importantly we will analyze cutoff and saturation mode of operation and this is really good because you have a lot of zeros in these rows right so you have to only remember these two values so your gate capacitance in cutoff is W C ox uh, times L effective and in saturation is two-thirds of that that's pretty much if you need to remember two things remember that and this is basically the story uh, that you really need to uh, remember another very important uh, slide here is everything clear uh, from this slide analysis okay great so now this is just a, a simplified model in reality all these capacitances are really highly nonlinear and they exib exhibit variations with voltage so it is good to look at a set of curves that display uh, gate capacitance as a function of VGS and as a function of VDS which is basically a function of the degree of saturation so what we notice here is that first of all uh, when your transistor is cut off you simply have a capacitor formed between your gate and uh, your bulk and you have WLC ox that is equal to your gate capacitance it's equal to that value over here so as soon as you start increasing your gate voltage your depletion region widens and then you have more immobile ions under the gate and basically widening the depletion region means increasing your uh, thickness of the capacitor so when the capacitor thickness increases that's uh, uh, that results in decrease of your gate capacitance 
On the other hand, when you look at the extreme case where you have inversion layer, then you basically have your gate capacitance equally distributed between source and drain electrodes. And what's happening around the threshold voltage when you, uh, for a very small increase of VGS around this threshold voltage, all of a sudden you attract a lot of carriers under the channel. So you have a lot of charge, which basically gives you a sharp increase in the gate to channel capacitance uh, on, on the source and drain side. And this increase uh, of uh, gate uh, channel capacitance on source and drain sides basically uh, means that you have now inverted layer under the gate and therefore you are isolating your uh, body terminal so you no longer have your bulk capacitance that goes to zero okay and what's interesting is this highly nonlinear effect over here when you plot a sum of all these capacitances all these components then you see a really substantial dip in the gate capacitance so what this tells you as a designer you would try to stay away uh, from this region of operation when you are uh, transitioning uh, between zero uh, over to VT when you're turning on your channel. And uh, we will see ways later on to uh, linearize this capacitance for uh, precise uh, performance analysis. But this is important to, to keep in mind. It's highly nonlinear capacitances. Now, let's see what happens with this gate to channel capacitance once we establish uh, the channel and then vary uh, drain to source voltage. So over here we plot drain to source voltage normalized to VGS minus VT. So when uh, VDS reaches VGS minus VT, then we have a pinch off at the drain side. Therefore, channel to uh, uh, gate to channel capacitance at the drain side goes down to zero. So we first had basically a linear region over here and uh, both source and drain capacitances were equal. So the gate capacitance was equally divided between these two. And as you increase the VDS, uh, then you have a pinch off over at uh, VDS is equal to VGS minus VT at the drain side, and your source capacitance increases uh, to 2 thirds WL uh, times C ox. And this is because you have widening the depletion region, so your cap uh, capacitance effectively reduces a little bit. So what we see from uh, uh, these two graphs is basically it would be very good to operate your transistor in deep saturation because then you have uh, your uh, capacitance uh, slightly reduced. Uh, and later on we will see uh, how we are uh, going to put this into performance analysis. Okay, this clear? Okay, good. Uh, so one way uh, to measure this uh, nonlinearity in the capacitance is uh, to perform a simple experiment uh, to measure the gate capacitance. And uh, what you know uh, from the fundamental uh, theory is that your current on a capacitor is proportional to uh, this uh, capacitance that is voltage dependent times TVGS over DT. So therefore you can calculate your uh, gate capacitance as the ratio of the current divided by DVGS over DT. And going back to slides, you can set up a simple uh, test circuit as shown in this slide. You have a current source going into this capacitance, and then uh, you observe the voltage change over some period of time, and then you basically just have that your capacitance is approximately equal to voltage divided by delta V over delta T. And when you plot that as a function of voltage, this is what we saw on uh, one of the slides back when your gate capacitance had a dip around the threshold. So you had decrease around the threshold uh, voltage and it had this, this discontinuity around this region. Okay, so we had, so far we had uh, gate capacitance that was uh, composed of two components. Uh, one was gate to channel capacitance, which was further subdivided across the three terminals, source, drain, and bulk. 
and we also have this overlap capacitance between source and drain uh, regions. Now we're going to understand the other uh, capacitive component that is very significant and very important, and those are the two capacitances that are connected uh, with the bulk uh, terminal. So you have basically co capacitance from bulk uh, with uh, source and drain uh, terminals. And we have to analyze uh, uh, this uh, junction of source and drain uh, with the body. And so we, we identify two components of uh, this diffusion uh, capacitance. So you have basically a depletion region between uh, your uh, source and drain and the bulk uh, terminals. And you have, uh, first of all, you have bottom plate capacitance that is formed uh, between your N plus region over here that has a doping concentration of ND and your P substrate with a doping concentration of NA. And um, if you assume that uh, the width of this diffusion region is uh, on the source side is equal to LS and it is also equal uh, to LD, then we have a transistor that is W wide. Then to calculate the diffusion capacitance, we adopt this linear model and then simply say that our uh, diffusion capacitance is equal to uh, junction capacitance per unit area times the area of that uh, junction. So you have uh, a PN junction over here. So you have basically junction capacitance per unit area times the area. So it's LS uh, times W. In addition to that, we have this sidewall. So that's basically a junction that is formed by this P plus uh, stop channel stop implant that has a doping concentration Na plus and the substrate. Now, since the doping concentration of uh, this P channel uh, stop implant is a P plus, it's higher than this doping concentration of the source region, then we have that uh, this capacitance per unit area is actually higher because you know from uh, the PN junction uh, theory that when you have two materials uh, next to each other uh, with different doping concentrations uh, that uh, you basically have that the amount of charge is proportional to the square root of the product uh, of the doping concentrations. So the higher the doping concentration, the more charge uh, and you have a higher capacitance. And um, then you calculate this per capacitance around the perimeter of a gate. So you have the side wall going all the way around. And you, you obviously don't have this channel stop implant under uh, the gate, because that's where you do want your channel. So you have this, these two sides and this uh, one side over here. So you have basically that you have junction capacitance side wall times the perimeter of this junction. So you, if you assume that you have basically uh, some junction capacitance, if you have uh, defined uh, capacitance per unit area so that you have that junction capacitance of this uh, side wall is equal to junction capacitance of side wall per unit area times uh, this depth of the side wall. So if you have your transistor and you have this junction that is XJ deep, then you have this side wall going all the way. And then you simply have that your Diffusion capacitance is a sum of two components. You have bottom and sidewall, where you have this one is equal capacitance of this junction over here if you have ND and then you have NA. Uh, so that is uh, junction capacitance per unit area times LS times W. And then you have this one over here that you have junction sidewall uh, times 2 times LS 
both of these sides plus W. Okay, so a couple more words about uh, junction capacitance, going back to slides, is from the theory of PN junction, when you have two material next to each other, uh, then uh, you basically have a depletion uh, charge uh, between uh, at, at the adjunction. And uh, you form that forms a play, uh, capacitor uh, between the two uh, materials that are connected next to each other. Uh, so you analyze that capacitance is basically highly nonlinear, and that that is also dependent on voltage. So we provide over here really a linear model for our capacitance for uh, the purpose of uh, analysis, hand analysis. So what what we have over here is basically we have uh, junction capacitance as a function of uh, the bias voltage across the terminal. So at zero bias, you have some nominal value of junction capacitance, Cj0. And then as you go toward reverse body bias, is if you apply reverse body bias, then uh, your junction widens. And then you have a wider junction, and your capacitance drops with voltage. On the other hand, if you go into forward body bias, then you have a sharp increase uh, in your capacitance. And now. Um, we assume that when you put uh, two materials next to each other, that the transition between one material and another material is instantaneous. And that's what we call abrupt junction. And we attribute uh, this uh, grading coefficient m uh, to that uh, metric that describes uh, uh, basically the transition between the two regions. So if you have abrupt junction, you put m is equal to 0 0.5 in this formula. And if you have more gradual transition between the two regions, then you have linear junction with m is equal to 0.33. And uh, we assume, for the, uh, for the previous uh, uh, case, we assume that uh, we had abrupt junctions in both cases. But you see the difference is uh, uh, not so uh, large. And we are mostly interested in this uh, region of operation, because uh, for the two capacitances that we are analyzing on the uh, drain and source side uh, with the bulk, we have actually reversed uh, body bias. Uh, we have reversed uh, uh, bias on, on these two junctions, because you have N plus that's connected to the drain, biased uh, to uh, voltage that is greater than 0, and then you have grounded bulk. So this is really region of uh, operation that we are interested in. And uh, therefore, we can really provide a linear model that is reasonably good approximation of what's going on uh, with this capacitance. And we do this uh, in this way. So you be, w what you need to basically do with uh, to linearize the capacitance is to replace this large signal equivalent uh, linear capacitance uh, that has the same amount of uh, charge over the voltage swing of interest. So you have basically delta Q over delta VD that is equal to your equivalent capacitance. If you, if you take that nonlinear curve, C versus V, and uh, figure out what's the amount of charge that gets displaced for a certain voltage swing, then you can linearize it with this model. And there is this uh, factor K equivalent that you don't need to remember, but uh, it's, it's shown here that it depends on uh, built-in uh, potential for a junction and the voltage swing and this grading factor that defines if your junction is abrupt or it's a linear junction. So that's basically all the capacitance components uh, that you need to uh, understand. And that's summarized in this graph uh, over here in this plot. You have your transistor that we began with. And uh, then we analyzed and identified uh, capacitive components of each of these um, capacitors over here. So you have gate to source and gate to drain that's equal to gate to channel capacitance and the overlap capacitance. And you have diffusion capacitance with um, source and drain terminals. And we have gate to channel capacitance between uh, gate and bulk. So now this seems a little bit overwhelming. So let's pause a little bit here and do one example just to understand 
uh, what are the values of these capacitances and uh, what we are going to be uh, dealing with. So let's assume that we have our quarter micron process and then we have T ox is equal to 6 nanometers. Then we assume minimum channel, 0.24 microns, and also assume minimum transistor with 0.36 micron wide. So it's a good idea to start with the, uh, such an example because uh, then you can pretty much scale the numbers. If you figure out the minimum sized uh, transistor, you can scale the numbers to figure out uh, other WNLs. So let's assume that uh, diffusion region is 625 nanometers wide and overlap capacitance between drain and source is 310 to the negative 10 farads per meter. Junction capacitance per unit area to 10 to the negative 3 farads per meter squared and we have sidewall capacitance at zero body bias 2.75 10 to the negative 10 farads per meter and let's assume that we are looking at zero bias condition So these values are for uh, zero bias. If you remember the previous graph, we had this voltage dependence, and this is the zero, zero bias uh, values over here. So let's first figure out uh, the gate capacitance. We have epsilon ox divided by T ox is 5.7 microns femtofarads per micrometer squared. And this is very important uh, constant to remember. It's about se 6 femtofarads per micron square. That's what you'll be coming at uh, back over and over again uh, in the class. So it gives, that gives us our gate to channel capacitance of 0.5 femtofarads. And now we have this uh, overlap capacitance. And this overlap capacitance actually includes that XD. So it's overlap capacitance per unit width, as it's defined here. So it's basically just the CO times W. And that is equal to 0.1 femtofarads. Now, what is gate capacitance uh, equal to in this case? In this case? What are the three components of gate capacitance? Right. And also, what's the other uh, effect that you over have over there? It's overlap, right? So you have to basically sum, uh, sum these uh, three capacitances. You have 0 0.5 plus overlap on both source and drain, so that gives you 0.7 femtofarad. So let's remember this answer over here. So let's now figure out the diffusion capacitances. So we have bottom plate capacitance that's equal 0.45 femtofarads and we have this sidewall sidewall capacitance that's equal junction sidewall zero body bias times 2 LD or LS plus W that's another 0.44 femtofarads so diffusion capacitance is the sum of these two so we have diffusion capacitance is also about 0.9 femtofarads And this is important to understand. So what you have at the zero bias is basically that uh, diffusion capacitance normally dominates this gate capacitance. And we'll come back to this uh, later on when we talk about the subthreshold a little bit 
So this is basically the CD that we introduced a few lectures back. Someone asked uh, what was the CD for this uh, subthreshold slope factor. So that's basically diffusion divided by uh, this um, capacitance of the gate. But uh, in most practical uh, cases that we will analyze, uh, this is not really true that uh, the gate capacitance is greater than the diffusion capacitance. What what happens is basically that we have gate capacitance is uh, normally greater than this diffusion capacitance and at most they're equal and the reason for that is that you will basically have reverse bias on um, these diffusion capacitances. So this analysis assumes zero bias case just to figure out, uh, to get a sense of the relative size of these capacitors. But when you bias your transistor into uh, saturation mode, uh, into conductive mode, uh, then uh, you have basically reverse bias on your uh, junctions. And therefore, uh, this component, diffusion capacitance, drops uh, and becomes smaller than the gate capacitance. OK? Let's go back to slides now. So this is a summary. This is what you need to remember. Uh, you basically need to remember formulas for these capacitances. Where do they come from? And remember this model so you can uh, quickly compute the capacitances. We'll do uh, some examples later on. And these are some of the typical parameters that you can find in your textbook of uh, various components uh, that uh, define your MOS capacitances. So now what we discussed so far uh, are some really simple models for hand analysis. And uh, in reality, those are just really some simplistic uh, approximations of real device physics. And uh, the behavior of MOS transistor is uh, much more uh, complex than what we uh, just talked about. Uh, in the class, and uh, uh, it has a lot of uh, second-order effects uh, that are just too complicated for hand analysis. And uh, here's a, a, a snapshot of some of the common uh, device parameters uh, that are used for SPI simulation. And uh, this isn't even uh, uh, the most up-to-date model. This is a very simple MOS1 model, level 1 model that uh, has quadratic equations and a uh, fairly simple model that uh, has all these parameters. So you basically can identify the DC parameters over here, VT0, KP, gamma, phi, lambda, that you uh, had to estimate in your homework. That's why they're important. Uh, and then you also have some second order parasitic effects, such as uh, parasitic resistances. Then we have some um, uh, transient uh, response parameters, such as these uh, capacitances, uh, and so on. So the real model is uh, much more complicated than this. It's uh, pages and pages of these uh, parameters. And you also have, uh, typically, that you have uh, different models for different uh, device geometries. One model uh, is rarely accurate for all Ws and Ls because of all the second order effects. Uh, that are pronounced uh, with small feature sizes. So you normally have model binning and say, I have one model card that I use uh, for minimum channel length and all the way up to maybe one micron, then from between one micron and five microns, then I have another uh, model. And sometimes uh, uh, you will probably uh, uh, make an, a mistake and put too long uh, of a channel and then you will have basically spice complaining, oh, I have some uh, bad news for you. I figure out that uh, your parameters, some parameters that are really important to me are negative. I can't really uh, proceed with the simulation because you just basically uh, define the mo uh, your transistor that is out of the bin. Uh, and that sometimes happens. And uh, when you see, see these errors, then it's probably that you specify your uh, widths and lengths uh, wrong way. So just make sure that you 
enter the correct uh, parameters if you uh, specify further specify your devices. So now let's do example case of two inverters connected next to each other and let's try to uh, derive capacitances uh, for this case and really understand uh, an inverter case so we can do some uh, delay analysis. So these are basically all the capacitances uh, that you have in this case. So you have driving inverter and you have the load or fan out inverter. And then over here between uh, gate and drain of this uh, first inverter you have gate and drain from capacitance from the M1 transistor and also gate and drain capacitance of M2 transistor. Then you have diffusion capacitances between uh, your drain regions uh, to bulk for both NMOS and PMOS. Then you have some wire capacitance. Why not? That's a realistic case, right? You have some uh, uh, side load. And then you have your fan out. In this case, you're interested to uh, see what's, what's the input capacitance to this gate. So you have a gate capacitance of this transistor M4 and you have a gate capacitance of this transistor M3. And this is really the simplified model. This is what you would like to end up with. Uh, to really simplify the model, you want to go back to the switching uh, model that we introduced a couple lectures back when you want to have equivalent resistance and equivalent capacitance. But in order to make that model, you really need to understand the contribution of uh, each of these factors uh, and small capacitances inside this big uh, lumped uh, output capacitance. So, okay, to compute uh, the gate capacitances, looking into the input of uh, this inverter, you have uh, basically gate to source capacitance for NMOS and PMOS, and we have gate to drain capacitance uh, for both of these devices. And we will, we will have to make some assumptions about uh, operation regime uh, of these transistors, and uh, that's coming up uh, real soon. But let's first identify the components, and then we will see from that table that we introduced at the beginning of uh, this lecture about various components of capacitances, we will choose uh, which operation regime is really applicable so that we can uh, choose appropriate values for each of these capacitances. Question? Um, yeah, on the previous slide, um, yeah, on the picture, I don't see the um, gate to source capacitor. On, on, the, on input, the first one, yes. On the input side? That's a very good question, and uh, uh, that comes basically from the understanding of uh, this model in a, in a way that we will model uh, this uh, first transistor as equivalent resistance. So what's on the input doesn't really matter. You just assume uh, for the first order analysis, we'll get back to that uh, later, but for the first order analysis we will just assume that we have a step input and then we model uh, a drive gate as some equivalent resistance uh, as shown in this uh, plot over here that you have basically just a simple inverter followed by the capacitance and then you model this as equivalent RC network. But in, in uh, uh, to be uh, fair and precise you do have uh, gate to source capacitances and uh, it, it may be a little bit confusing but it's going to be uh, obvious uh, I think in uh, the next uh, couple of slides why we did use this gate to drain but not gate to source because uh, as we said this, this was the floating capacitance between these two nodes so it's really of interest to figure out what are all the capacitances that are connected to the output over here so you th th that's how you can uh, find uh, this equivalent uh, lumped uh, capacitance so at the output you have diffusion you have this gate to drain, looking back through the gate, you have wire capacitance and load capacitance of the fan out gate. Good question, thank you. Okay, so when you have uh, floating capacitance between the two nodes, what you have is basically that your input goes 0 to 1 and your output goes 1 to 0. So when you experience uh, uh, a voltage swing over that capacitor in uh, different directions, 
then uh, you have uh, what we call the Miller effect. And uh, you're all familiar with uh, this. You heard about Miller effect? OK, great. So you don't need to spend time on this. But basically, it's, uh, the point is, uh, real like a 30 second overview is uh, to make equivalent uh, model uh, that you basically model your uh, feedback uh, impedance uh, as input impedance Z1 and output impedance Z2. So you basically eliminate uh, this feedback. So you can uh, model this uh, floating capacitance as two independent capacitances that are connected to ground. And in order to derive these expressions, you really need to start from this current. You have uh, on this side I1 is equal V in times 1 minus A divided by ZF because V out is equal to uh, A times V in. And then in this case, that still has to call. So you have V in is equal to I1 is equal to V in over Z1. And also on this side, you have that I1 is ha has to be equal uh, negative V out divided by Z2. So that's the current that has to go to this node. And the net result is that you have that your input impedance is equal to your feedback impedance divided by the gain, 1 minus A, and that results in multiplication of uh, your capacitance at the input side uh, by the factor 1 minus A, and at the output side you have uh, that uh, C2, rather here, is equal to Cf times 1 minus 1 over A. Now, in the CMOS example, uh, we have to make a uh, assumption here and uh, some simplistic uh, approximation that uh, we have a plus delta V on the input side and minus delta V on the output side. And then we have to model this uh, inverter as uh, the gain element with the gain is equal to negative 1. And now you may dispute that. Uh, and if you're thinking why minus 1, why not some other number, then you have a very valid uh, reason to ask yourself that question. And um, because we saw that uh, the inverter gain can be substantially larger than 1. And what we are really going to do here is that uh, we are going to take a large signal uh, model, lar large signal approximation that is uh, turns out to be valid for uh, performance analysis. And we will assume basically that our input for uh, the gate uh, calcul delay calculation purposes has to go between 0 and VDD over 2. And for the same amount of time, uh, and f uh, your output has to go from VDD to VDD over 2. So you basically have equal swing in opposite direction. That's what you're interested in. So to define the delay points, 50% transition points, 0 to VDD over 2, VDD to VDD over 2. So then you can approximate this uh, gain as uh, minus 1. OK. So that's the Miller effect that a capacitor experience identical but opposite voltage swing uh, can be replaced by a capacitor to ground with twice the value, both input and output. Question? If, if you're looking at, uh, you're looking in from the output node, um, you don't have a Miller effect, but what happens to CGD? Um, do you ground it or look at it as a parallel to CGS from the output side? From the output side, uh, OK, so if you go back to this Miller uh, theory, you replace this impedance with two independent impedances. One is at the reflected at the input, and this impedance is reflected from the output. So you have two capacitances from uh, the Miller effect. You have one at the input side, one at the output side, and that's shown here. So you basically have this capacitor is replaced with these two equivalent capacitances. Okay. So now let's compute uh, the capacitances in this uh, simplified model. Uh, so let's do it over here. Go back over here. So if we assume that we have this configuration, we have two inverters
Okay. So now the question. How come we don't consider CGD 3.4? CGD 3.4, excellent question, coming to that in a second. Great. Okay, uh, so now we need to compute uh, this equivalent load capacitance. Uh, in order to do so, we need to understand the region of operation of both of these uh, devices such that we can make uh, good assumptions. So let's assume that uh, we have basically, uh, let's look at this load transistor. So what's going to happen in this case, we will have basically, let's say, a transition from VDD high to low. And if we had initially high voltage over here, logic 1, and then we have V out 2, this is logic 0. So what's, what's going on when you uh, undergo uh, this falling transition, that means that this device goes from uh, turn off, cut off, to saturation because this voltage is still high and since this one is turned uh, goes now to let's see if this one goes yes this one was one goes to zero and this one is now in uh, linear because okay you have to basically consider uh, this case when your uh, input goes between VDD and VDD over 2 so in this uh, uh, regime over here, when your input is between VDD and VDD over 2, this one slowly goes from off to saturation, and this one stays in linear. Uh, now, since you have a delay between input and output, and then that comes to your question, since you have some finite delay of this stage, TP of the stage 2, uh, then basically by the time uh, you calculate your uh, you have your propagation delay here TP1 basically by the time you reach the 50% point of at this node that's what you're interested for in calculating the, the TP1 right but at the time you're uh, at the 50% point over here your output really hasn't started uh, its transition so therefore you ignore Miller effect and you don't have a uh, Miller effect at this node. So it's just a floating node. Ignore that capacitance. So that helped, actually. Uh, in this case, so you have CGD1 uh, gate drain. So this capacitance over here is equal to simply 2 times, because you have two devices, CGD. 0 times W uh, N plus 2 times C G uh, let's see gate to drain C G D 0 times W P this actually includes the sor uh, gate to source capacitances over here uh, this is basically between, uh, this is a little bit confusing, so let me explain that. So this is basically the capacitance that you see between gate and drain terminals. Uh, and um, you have to include this overlap uh, capacitance. Then you have this uh, drain to bulk uh, capacitance uh, is equal to uh, this uh, K equivalent N times uh, junction capacitance times area drain plus junction sidewall times perimeter drain and then you finally have these gate capacitances over here so we said that uh, this one was uh, going from turn off into saturation so we have C ox W P L P and this one was in linear region so we have C ox W N times L N. Uh, C W you will find from uh, parasitic extraction. So this is <coughs> uh, 
parasitic extraction and load capacitance in simply the sum some of these capacitances. So in this case, uh, you have Miller effect over here from this guy, right? Because that's where you assume that you have opposite voltage swing uh, going on. So then couple important points. So we have Miller on C, G, D, 1, 2. Neglect Miller on C, G, D, 3, 4. And what else is important here is that uh, operation regime of uh, these gate capacitances is equal to C aux W L. Question? Question. So uh, CG3 is a combination of uh, CGS and CGD? CG3 is combination, yes, that's correct. Dot, excuse me? Uh, the question was if uh, CG3 was a combination of CGS and CGD, and that's correct. Answer. Also, could you explain the case that you said you don't have to worry about the Miller effect? Like Okay. What, at what time do you exactly do that? So what what happens is that you basically have that's a very important point. Um, so you have your inverter number one, and you have your load inverter. So this is your V in, this is your V out, V out two. So let's say you have transition at the input goes. 0 to 1 and then after some propagation delay you have your so this is your V in this is your V out and then after some other propagation delay for the stage 2 so you have TP1 then you have again rising transition over here Now, the window in which I am uh, computing the delay of this first uh, inverter is this window over here. So this is my starting point, and this is my end point. So during this time over here, I have a steady signal at the output. So it, it really does not kick back uh, to this node V out because that transition occurs later in time. Okay, it's important to understand. Yes. Uh, so, it, but if you have like let's say three or four more inver inverters, uh, then you have to actually include the effect. You you can't neglect that. Is that correct? Uh, for a single stage, if you have a chain on inverters, if you just look at the single stage, then you don't include Miller effect from the next stages because their transitions occur later. For the next stage, you will include a Miller effect on, of, of that stage, but you have to make sure that they are spaced out in time because their delays are uh, come uh, later in the picture. Okay, good. If you understood that, uh, then I think that's all you need to know about uh, capacitances. Uh, so, um, just to introduce the next lecture uh, for the propagation delay. Uh, we basically s uh, developed uh, two transistor models so far. This is the transistor model uh, that uh, is uh, current source equivalent, and uh, that can be used c certainly for delay analysis, but if you start writing all these equations uh, for current, uh, then the, the expressions will become overly complicated. And uh, this delay mod this model was actually pretty good for uh, DC analysis and understanding of voltage transfer characteristics. Uh, you will have more exercise on that in uh, homework number three. And in order to uh, have uh, uh, really simple design equations, uh, we will analyze this resistive model, where you model the delay as a function of this uh, RC equivalent uh, uh, delay. And uh, 
let me just then let me just uh, repeat this uh, so you can uh, re refresh this material so you can uh, come ready for the next class. Uh, so this is actually the uh, switch model that we introduced uh, that you model your transistor as equivalent resistance. And then if you look at this IV curve, this is basically the resistance is the slope of this uh, IV uh, line. So over here at VDD, you have the highest resistance. Then as you traverse down uh, this path from VDD uh, to zero, then your resistance decreases, decreases, you reach the midpoint, and then it finally stays constant in this uh, operation uh, regime when it's in uh, triode mode, transistor is in triode. Um, for the purposes of uh, analysis, uh, we linearized this model, and we just said uh, that we are interested in this transition region over here, over which uh, resistance is reasonably linear with voltage. And under that assumption, we can uh, use this simple model uh, and treat transistor as equivalent resistor. And now that you understand uh, the capacitive uh, components uh, that are coming to play uh, with analysis of MOS transistors and we have the resistor model, then we'll be able to do uh, performance analysis next time. because of the opposite voltage swing. Wait, sorry, can you say that again? That, that's the other, my other question. How, how is Miller effect explained on, on, the, on CGD right here? Because you have rising transition and falling transition, so right. you have the, this business over here. Okay, so then, do these two equations take into account Miller effects? Uh, yes. They Miller do? effect Miller effect is over here. That's two? two? Yeah. You're right, one CGD Okay. But we end up having one capacitance from VL tied to ground and one capacitance from V in tied to ground right here. Right? Yes, yeah, so you, you would put it normally to V in, but we uh, assume that in this model that V in is an yeah. ideal voltage source. Right. So you really don't care about... But then, uh, so they're the same? The, the two capacitance that we draw? Yes, think, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I thought they would be different. <laughs> yeah, they are the same because you assume gain of negative one. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a question with regard to the VT you said. Uh -huh. uh, isn't VT just something that we put for analysis some a threshold that we use for analysis. In reality there exists no abra absolutely, absolutely. So we don't have this kind of effect in, in real transistors. This is just a model, right? This is real transistor. This is not real because if it was real we wouldn't get I mean this is a spice spice model, right? Spice model, that's right. Spice model of level yeah. forty nine or something. But it's sure, still sure, not sure, real. Sure. You still have to def define some V T for the spice, right? But Correct. there is no abrupt V T for the real transistor because that's right. V T right. is just it's just it's it's like we, we say that we want it as much P as it was N. So this V T is equal to two times phi F, right? Uh -huh. So there's no exact V T.